So we've been going through a series called After God's Heart, tracking through the life of King David. And what we're going to see this morning is we're going to see how David acted in some passivity, where he kind of let some situations happen in his life rather than, be, rather than being proactive in trying to prevent them or to give some leadership to them. So I found a comic this week, a comic strip from uh, the classic Calvin and Hobbes that I wanted to start by showing you this morning that talks about this passivity. Calvin is talking about his TV watching habits when he says, I try to, to make television watching a complete forfeiture of experience. Notice how I keep my jaw slack so my mouth hangs open. I try not to swallow either so I drool and I keep my eyes half focused so I don't use any muscles at all. I take a passive entertainment and extend the passivity to my entire being. I wallow in my lack of participation and response. I'm utterly inert. Hobbes replies to him, I'm going to leave before you start attracting flies. <laughs> Calvin finally says, I can almost feel my neural transmitters shutting down. And this cartoon sarcastically shows to us what uh, something that uh, catches on to something that I think are, has become huge in our culture. Because of the wealth of options that we have for entertainment, I think we have become a very passive culture, simply being entertained rather than being proactive and participating that's in the world around us. We've become experts at letting situations pass right by us where we could share the gospel with somebody, where we could friend, befriend somebody that is in need and or even allow for things that we wouldn't have allowed for even 20 years ago. We just let pass by now because we are afraid of several different things. But I want to start and, and define what I mean by passivity. Well, the dictionary def defines it as an acceptance of what happens without active response or resistance. And so the problem with this, this kind of an idea, is that when we are passive in situations where we need to be proactive or don't give any resistance when we know something is wrong and we shouldn't accept what happens as reality, what can happen is there can be some really major and negative effects to that. And so the question is, why do we act in passivity? Why do we do this? I think primarily, I think it's because we live in a culture that's highly individualistic. We don't want to get involved in others, other people's business, especially if it's unwelcome. We might be afraid to offend somebody. We might be afraid of being rejected in a friendship if we step over a line. Or we might even feel like hypocrites from our own struggles because we feel like we can't speak up because we've done the very same thing thing. Or maybe we think, oh, you know, maybe I'm seeing that situation incorrectly. Maybe I'm, I'm misinterpreting something. I'm not understanding it fully. And it'll take care of itself. But as we're going to see today from the life of David, when we, when we live in passivity, there can be major effects. We'll see three effects of passivity and what they lead to. And instead, we want to focus on how we live proactively in the gospel of Jesus Christ, recognizing that the spirit that we were given when we believe in Jesus enables us to be proactive. And so it leads to this, that passivity leads to immorality, disorder, and separation. But gospel proactivity leads to righteousness, peace, and reconciliation. So let me give you some background in this story of what we're about to cover. 2 Samuel 11 and 12 is the very famous, infamous, I should say, David and Bathsheba incident where David sees a beautiful woman, he sees her bathing, he brings her into his house, sleeps with her, and he impregnates her and then has her husband killed in order to try and mask the fact that this happened. And so as a consequence, the prophet Nathan tells David that the sword will never depart from your house. And what he means by that is he's going to be in constant conflict throughout the rest of his life. And there's going to be tension. He's not going to have peace in his kingdom anymore. And some of this is going to surround his own kingdom in terms of who is going to succeed him, which one of his sons is going to be his successor. But unfortunately, much like some judges of old, like Eli and Samuel, who ruled the nation of Israel, David's sons are not righteous men. David has not had any control over his sons, and none of them are worthy to take over the throne. And we see that he almost loses his throne. His son Absalom tries to stage a coup when he sees that there's an opportunity to become king. He tries to defeat his father, rebel against him, and become king himself. 
And so when we look at this story, this story that we're going to cover today in 2 Samuel 13, it kind of starts the whole thing. It kind of begins this whole section of the story where David's kingdom is no longer at peace. And in many ways, David had it absolutely coming to him. First of all, he expressly disobeyed a command from Deuteronomy 17 that said the king is not to accumulate many wives or else they will lead his heart astray. David had upwards of nine wives and he had concubines as well. So David definitely missed the mark on that one. But he especially wasn't to have wives that were Gentiles like Absalom, his third son's mother. And we find that in 1 Kings 1.6, it says that with, uh, uh, with his son Adonijah, that David never rebuked him. That David never called him out and said, why, why do you do those things? He didn't correct him as a father should towards his child. And so, yes, it's kind of hard to make very confident assertions uh, that this was the practice for all of his sons. But I think with up, uh, upwards of nine wives... 19 sons, and we don't even know how many daughters he had. I think this was a lot for one man to try and keep track of. And so there were a lot of things happening in his family and a lot of things happening in his house that he didn't know about. So let's begin. 2 Samuel 13. If you need to have a Bible, grab the hardcover back in the seat in front of you. Uh, it'll be page 312. Let's begin verse 1. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now Amnon had an advisor named Jonadab, son of Shemaiah, David's brother. Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He asked Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother's sister, Absalom's sister. Go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread in my sight so I may eat from her hand. David sent word to Tamar at the palace, go to the house of your brother Amnon and prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to the house of her brother Amnon, who was lying down. She took some dough, kneaded it, made the bread in his sight, and baked it. Then she took the pan and served him the bread, but he refused to eat. Send everyone out of here, Amnon said. So everyone left him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food here into my bedroom so I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. So Amnon is the oldest of David's sons. He is actually the heir apparent to the throne. He is the chief prince, but the apple of godliness has clearly fallen very far from the tree of his father. And what we see in this story is it's very, probably very difficult for David to watch this happen, seeing his sons act so wickedly, as we'll see with his son Absalom later, and begin to wonder, who, who's worthy? Which of my sons are worthy to take the throne? But then you look at his daughter Tamar, and you see that she's described as this beautiful woman, but that she's also now of marriageable age. She's reached that maturity, and she's a virgin. And it shows that in this story that she is actually a woman of some character. And for whatever reason, Amnon lusted after her. He wanted her, and he knew it was against the law. There were express laws against this kind of interaction because it was incest. They were half-siblings, but it was still incest. And so his desires and plans show that he was more like the world around him rather than being like the king or the son's or the king, the, sorry, I can't say that right. He is the son of the king and the heir to the throne of Israel. He is not showing any sort of character whatsoever. But his countenance instead, because he can't have, he feels like he can't have his sister 
for himself. He is now a depressed man. And so much so that others begin to notice, including his cousin, Jonadab. And Jonadab is described as a very shrewd man in this passage. And actually, when we, one of the commentators I read looking at, the, studying for this, said that Amnon, or Jonadab might actually be the most, one of the most dangerous men in the story because of his shrewdness, his wisdom, actually. And this is, what he's, this is what this commentator had to say. He is dangerous because he has skill without scruple, wisdom without ethics, insight without integrity. And so he is willing to work any angles possible to breach the accomplished goals that he has, or to accomplish the goals that he has in mind. And so his advice is for Amnon to pretend to be sick, and then when David comes, to ask for Tamar to come and be the one to care for him. And I don't think Jonadab's plan was to have Amnon rape her, but to create this secretive encounter where no one would know. No one would know about it, and Amnon's desires could be fulfilled. So Amnon likes the sound of this plan, and he decides to go with it. He lays down in bed, pretends to be sick. His father comes, and, he, and while he's there, Amnon requests that his sister come and care for him, and David gives in to that. And Jonadab might have been counting on that, that David was kind of lenient with his sons and what their requests were. So he says, sure, I'll send Tamar over. And then she, it says he, she starts making bread in his sight. And my stomach starts to get kind of queasy just thinking about this because he's, she's doing this in his sight and you know what he's already thinking and that he has plans in his mind to be alone with her. And yet this is his half-sister and he's... And this just make, should make us feel disgusting. And I talked to somebody after the last service. I said, you just can't make this up. This is the Bible. The Bible is very clear and very real about what happens and how sin can really affect things. And so when, when she starts to feed him and he makes up some excuse that he's not feeling well enough and she needs to feed him and they're now alone, it says that he grabbed her. And actually the word in Hebrew actually means that he overpowered her. He took control of her. And so his first offer was something of a consensual encounter. And she refuses because she's saying, this, such a thing should not be done in Israel. This is against the law. This is not how things should go. And so she says, just instead, let's, let's, let's see if the king will allow us to get married. And she tries to appeal to some sort of sense of morality within Amnon. And it's very clear he doesn't have that. He doesn't have that sense of morality. What he has instead is selfish desires. So she's saying, this would disgrace me. This would mark me as being unmarriageable, which is actually the way this culture would work. If, if a woman wasn't a virgin, they were viewed as less than marriageable material and often would have a hard time finding a husband, even if it had been done by rape. I'm not trying to tell you that this was right. This is just the way the culture was. And God had, this is what God had to work with sometimes. And God had to kind of create some laws in order to protect women. And so, there, so she's saying, and just let's go to the king. Let's see if he'll allow us to get married. But instead, he decides to rape her. And it makes it very clear that his motive was not true love. It was not an intimate relationship with her. But it was simply selfish gratification for himself. And this was not real love of the heart, but this was true lust of the flesh. And so we see from how David parented his children early on in their lives, most likely, and how he didn't seem to be aware of what was happening in his own household. This leads us to our first effect. That passivity leads to immorality, but gospel proactivity guides us to righteousness. <laughs> In terms of parenting, it's not truly possible to know how, God, how David parented his children in their younger years. But it's very clear from the story that David was passive in, his early, in, in the way that he parented them as adults. And it doesn't seem as if David did what all the Israelites were commanded to do, which was to teach their children how to love the Lord their God with all their heart, to do as he commanded, to love their neighbor as themselves. Because you see his sons act unruly and wicked and manipulative towards other people, acting in sin. Listen to this from Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This was a principle that was laid out in Israel in the way that this is the way they were supposed to raise their children. So keep in mind here, 
First of all, this was written by his son Solomon after, likely written by his son Solomon after David had lived. But the Proverbs are not promises. They're not formulas. They're not always going to happen this way. They are general rules and they don't deal with the exceptions because there are exceptions where we as Christians might train up our children how to follow Jesus, but then they won't do it. They will reject it for whatever reason. But still, with how David raised Adonijah, we kind of see that there was likely a pattern of behavior in how his sons acted in wickedness. This is probably something that David was doing all the time. So his parents, this is something we have to keep in mind. Our goal is not just to make our children successful in life or competent in life skills or to make sure that they're just well-behaved children and they don't speak up against or don't speak against authority in rude ways or to be respectful people but our job is to develop their character as they follow Christ we're to teach them what the gospel means and so this begins when they're little we teach them the gospel that they have a sin condition in their heart that causes their bad behavior and makes them not right with God, and that they need Jesus, who is the only one who could cleanse them of their sin because of what he did on the cross. This is how we do it with our two-year-old Avery. We'll tell her that when she does something and she's acting kind of in a naughty way, we'll tell her, "You're, you're showing you have a very yucky heart right now. We'll tell her she has yuckies, okay? She has yuckies in her heart, and that only Jesus can take away her yuckies. Only Jesus can do that. And so we pray with her. We tell her that, you know, you got to say you're sorry and all that. But we also teach her how much God loves her, much more than mommy, daddy could ever love her, but that we'll always love her no matter what, even if she is showing a very yucky heart all the time. But we also focus on apologizing, saying we're sorry when we make mistakes because we need to show her. We want to model for her what repentance and forgiveness looks like when we make mistakes. And I just want to say, it's never too late to start doing these things with your children. Even if they're grown or they're a little bit older in their teen years, you might, and for some of you who have adult children, you might might feel more uh, regret than you do triumph in the way that you raise your children. But here's my suggestion. You can go to them humbly and ask for their forgiveness for the mistakes that you made. You can't tell them what to do anymore. But you can certainly model repentance, forgiveness, and grace and the love of Christ to them. But if you're not a parent, you and you can model this in a different way with your friendships. If you see a friend that's starting to drift away into something that you know is dangerous for them, call them out on it and say, I love you. I don't want you to go this direction. Because if you let them, if you say, you know, I just don't know if I'm gonna be able to make a difference, if you let them go through it, go through that without saying something. You might allow for them to continue to fall into it more and more deeply and make it harder for them to pull out of it. But instead, to be proactive with the gospel, we recognize we have a deep and desperate need for Jesus and that his spirit enables us to proactively pursue him, to go after him. And when we do that, it necessarily leads to greater righteousness in our lives. And that as well, those who are under our influence, when we pursue Christ, when we are proactive in our relationship with him, those who are under our care, whether kids or those under our leadership, they will see Jesus working in us, see the difference. And this is partially, this is a huge reason why the apostles frequently say this in the New Testament, to make every effort when it comes to our faith in Christ. And that we need to remember that passivity will lead us to immorality, but gospel proactivity will lead to righteousness. Let's continue verse 15. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. No, she said to him, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing an ornate robe, for this was the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornate robes she was wearing. She put her hands on her head and went, went away, weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom said to her, has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. 
And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. So Amnon quickly turns. He hates his sister more than he had, quote unquote, loved her. Because remember, this was all about lust. And it's possible that Amnon's feelings of hatred were more actually kind of projections of his own self-hatred for how he was feeling, how he was acting. And we have to ask the question, because we see this, this does not make sense in our culture, what Tamar says to him, that sending her away would be worse than what he's already done to her. Why did she say that? Well, I think based on the culture, again, that a woman not being married and not having children would be viewed as a disgrace and as cursed, that what she's saying to him is this is making things even worse. You're not remedying the situation at all. You're making things even worse. He's compounding his sin. He's making his wickedness even worse by sending her away, and he's not even treating her with any sort of dignity. When he says, and the NIV that we read uh, softens this, it says, NIV says, get this woman out. What he actually says is, get this out. Doesn't even dignify her as a human being in that moment. That all she was was just an object of his lust. So he says, get this out. And then he locks the door. And that kind of was basically saying, I don't want any part of her anymore. I don't want her around. I don't want to see her ever again. But also to Tamar, it might have been symbolic of the fact that she was now that part of her life of marriage and children, these things that defined women in that time, that was locked for her as well, that there was no possibility she could get into that. So as an expression of this grief, she tears these ornate robes, these gifts, this, this, these garments that were given to her by her father to signify she was a virgin daughter of the king, this this, and they were ornate, they were beautiful. She tears them, basically showing, I'm no longer this, I'm grieving, I'm upset. She puts her hands on her head, which is basically saying, I'm in captivity of my grief and my anger. I can't escape this. And so she comes to her brother, Absalom. They have the same mother and father. And she comes to him. And Absalom's attempts to, confront, or to comfort her seem a little weak, but what he's doing is something very interesting here. He's basically telling her, look, don't take this thing to heart. He's not telling her, trying to minimize it, trying to lessen that, ah, it wasn't that big a deal what he did, because it was a big deal. It was a huge deal what he did. But he's basically saying, look, don't let that, whatever that happened, dominate your thinking, but also subtly he's saying, let me take care of that justice. Let me take care of it. Because the reality is David's reaction is really, really weak. It says that he was furious, but he did nothing about it. Did nothing. Brought no consequences on Amnon at all. And part of his lack of activity in this way, his passivity, could be the fact that he would look at this situation and it would look very similar to what he did with Bathsheba. And he might feel like a hypocrite. But at the very least, because he's the king, he should say, Amnon... You're not going to be the king. You cannot be because of how you acted. There were ways in the Old Testament law for them to address this. First of all, the, uh, the guilty party who committed the rape was supposed to pay 50 shekels of silver to the father, and then he was actually to marry that woman. Now, that sounds crazy to our culture, crazy to us. But what they're trying to do is to prevent that rape okay, from ever happening so the men would realize, okay, not only am I doing this very selfish thing, but I am also now going to be responsible to make sure that this woman is protected, that this woman has dignity, that this woman is treated with respect for the rest of her life because people would look at her and say, she is not disgraced. She is not cursed. And so yes, it was, it's kind of harsh. It seems weird but it was a way to try and protect women and to also to say, men, this is, this is the consequence. This is what you do. This is why you treat women with respect. And so David may not have allowed the marriage to happen, even though that's what Tamar was trying to push and trying to protect herself. But then you see Absalom's response and he chooses to say nothing to Amnon. And it reveals to us that Amnon, uh, Absalom's form of evil is kind of scary. Because it's not irrational, it's not reactive, he doesn't blow up, he waits. Two years. 
And so he's a planning, cunning, patient kind of evil, and he's a little bit scary in that way. And so this leads us to our second effect, that passivity leads to disorder, but gospel proactivity leads to peace. David's leadership as king and father had begun to fail because of the way that he had been passive, and it led to great disorder in his kingdom and in his family. And so we see this in real life everywhere. We see where leaders have been passive and it led to disorder. It led to things fall apart. We know this from our own experience that when we are passive in certain situations, it'll lead to chaos. That's the way things are in our world. And so that's why it's extremely important for those of us who are parents, those of us who are leaders, that we would be the kind of people to not be passive and to keep people accountable, to hold up high standards towards our children and towards the, those under our care. Because here's the thing, those who respond to that kind of account accountability and that kind of leadership and respond well to it, those are the kind of people you want on your team. But if they don't respond well, if people don't respond well to that and react against it, then that's clearly someone you don't want on your team because they don't want to be held accountable to their actions. But we need to look when it comes to our proactivity within the gospel. We need to remember what the Apostle Peter said, that we have been given everything we need to live a godly life through God's Spirit dwelling and living inside of us when we believe in Christ, and this can help us move past our passivity. Because when we know this and we live this as truth, that we have been given everything we need to live a godly life, and then we are proactive, it can lead to peace in our relationships. And not peace like a good feeling, like I'm just at peace. I feel good about the way my life is going, but peace as in terms there's no disorder, there's no strife, there's no fighting because those under our care know what the standards are, know what they are accountable to and will rise to the occasion and that know that there are consequences for their actions. Let's continue last section, verse 23. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazor near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. Absalom went to the king and said, your servant has had shearers come. Will the king and his attendants please join me? No, my son, the king replied. All of us should not go. We would, not, we would only be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, if not, please let my brother Amnon come with us. The king asked him, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of the king's sons. Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Then all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. While they were on their way, the report came to David. Absalom has struck down all the king's sons. Not one of them is left. The king stood up, tore his clothes, and lay down on the ground, and all his attendants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, son of Shimea, David's brother, said, My lord should not think that they killed all the princes. Only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's express intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. My lord the king should not be concerned about the report that all the king's sons are dead, only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom had fled. Now the man standing watch looked up and saw many people on the road west of him coming down the side of the hill. The watchman went and told the king, I see men in the direction of Horonaim on the side of the hill. Jonadab said to the king, See, the king's sons have come. It has happened just as your servant said. As he finished speaking, the king's sons came in, wailing loudly. The king, too, and all his attendants wept very bitterly. Absalom fled and went to Talmai, son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. But, to king David, but king David mourned many days for his son. After Absalom fled and went to Geshur, he stayed there three years. And king David longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. So Absalom waited two years to enact his revenge. By that time, David might have forgotten about it. Amnon might have pressed it away in his mind so that this revenge would have come as a complete surprise. And his ruse that he pulls is one to bring about this huge celebratory party, bring all the king's sons. And actually, it was kind of a way for him to position himself 
to be the next successor, to be the successor of the king. And so even though he invited David, it was a calculated risk. Why he does it, and even though, I mean, David could have come, and he might not have, and he probably wouldn't have fallen, followed through on killing Amnon, but it was a calculated risk because he was trying to manipulate David in order for him to send, to make sure to send Amnon along with this as the representative of the king because he is the chief prince, the su successor to the throne. And so David does seem to be kind of suspicious about this. He asks, why should, why should I send Absalom? But he still goes through with it because he had already said no to one thing. And so now he may have felt pressured to say yes to another. And so Absalom's plan is to get Amnon drunk, wait till his spirits are high, and then to attack him when he is most vulnerable. And he tells his assassins, it's kind of interesting, he tells them, don't, don't be afraid. And I think because they were fearing repercussions that the king might send on them for killing his oldest son, his heir apparent to the throne. But Absalom seems to be promising them some sort of protection. So he orders them to be killed, or orders them to kill Amnon, and the rest of the brothers don't even hesitate. They get up and they flee. They run, feared for their lives, and probably because the news of their death with the false news of their death arrived first, they probably went through some secretive back roads trying to hide to protect themselves, to keep themselves safe. But even though this was false news, at, the, at this news, David's weight of guilt, knowing that this came from his own sin with Bathsheba, that this was a consequence, that the sword would never leave his house, he probably immediately thought of that and felt a huge weight of guilt and that's probably what, and that's why he tore his clothes, why he grieves, why he's so sad. But then we see this man, this shrewd man, Jonadab, show up again. And he's playing the other side this time. And he tells David, it's only Amnon that's dead. Trust me, I know. Probably because he had talked to Absalom about this at some point. And so even though this is still the truth, it still would have left David feeling extremely sad, guilty, grievous over his son dying. And so Absalom, he flees as well, but he instead goes to the land of his grandfather, the king of Geshur. Remember, a Gentile, this was a Gentile wife that David took on, and Absalom hides there for three years. But what we see through the rest of the story from chapters 14 through 18, Absalom stages a coup to try and take over Israel. He tries to destroy his father's kingdom. He tries to turn the hearts of the people of Israel to himself. You see, David allows him to come back allows Absalom to come back after three years. But then two years, Absalom stayed in the city without seeing his father. And you could just imagine the anger that this young man had towards his father. And so the way that David acted in this, this leads us to our third and final effect, that passivity ultimately leads to separation, but gospel proactivity leads to reconciliation. While we might think that we're keeping friendships or making our kids happy by allowing them to do whatever they want or not offending others, not putting boundaries on relationships, when we are passive in this way, I think we are actually writing a story to where we are going to end a friendship and bring separation. Because we can see from the story of Absalom that David's passivity led him, led Absalom to try and take control of the kingdom as we saw through the rest of the story. And Absalom and David are never again father and son. They're never again in a right relationship because of what happens here. And so when we look at how we need to act proactively in the gospel, while sometimes, sometimes relationships end because of the fact that we have been following Christ, God's Spirit can enable incredible reconciliation. I've seen it in my own time in ministry. I've seen alcoholic or abusive parents be brought back into a relationship with their children from forgiveness and repentance and sorrow, godly sorrow for sin. I've seen friends who were estranged, who hated each other because of words that were said, actions that were done, brought back into a right relationship with, with each other. I've seen marriages on the brink of divorce about to go and sign the papers to officially, legally end that marriage come back and those they be reconciled to each other. But most of all, the biggest thing that has ever happened in terms of reconciliation 
is a wayward people to a loving God. Today, I want you to consider how there is a God who loved each and every one of us enough to become human and die for us on the cross, even though we had continually chosen against him, and he wants to be reconciled to us in a right relationship with him again. I want you to think of the, of the prodigal son and his father in that story. When the father sees his son coming from afar off, the father runs to him and embraces him welcomes him home, welcomes him home, even though the son had hurt him deeply. This is God's heart for those who have walked away from him. And this is ultimately what the gospel is designed to do. And so I think the worst example of passivity we see in all of scripture actually is at the, is at the very beginning in Genesis chapter three. You see, I think unfairly Eve gets the blame for why sin entered the picture. Because Paul in Romans 5 blames Adam. And here's why. Because Adam was standing right there while she was being tempted. Adam was right there. And in Genesis chapter 2, God had told him, don't eat from that tree. Don't do it. So he should have passed that along to Eve, but also in that moment told her, hey, God said no to this. Forget what he's saying. Let's move on over here. And so what this shows us is that passivity is not just a little tiny struggle that we have, a personality quirk of maybe being a people pleaser, but this shows that we, at our, at our very core, a brokenness of our hearts that can only be redeemed by believing in Jesus Christ and that he has atoned for every single one of our sins. And that passivity is a sign that we place our priorities above God's and that we need to turn from this turn away from this mentality and turn to God and look to be proactive like Jesus because this is what Jesus did. Jesus didn't hesitate to call out sin in those he loved when he saw it. He also didn't hesitate to love those who needed his love. But most of all, he didn't wait for us to figure out this sin thing on our own. Instead, he proactively pursued us and he saw that there was no way we could handle it on our own. Came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross, taking the punishment for our sin and rose from the dead to defeat sin and death. And so that this means that anything that leads us to be passive was crucified on the cross with Christ and is dead and we need to live as if they are dead. Run away from passivity and instead live, live a spirit-led proactivity from God's enabling grace. And what that also means is to pursue others. Pursue others who don't know Christ because God has pursued us. To be proactive in reaching others because Christ was proactive in reaching us. And so... Let's remember what we learned from the very beginning, that passivity leads to immor immorality, disorder, and separation, but gospel proactivity leads to righteousness, peace, and reconciliation. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And God, we just pray that we would be people who would love you and follow you with our lives. God, we are in awe of your grace, your mercy, that you deeply love us despite the sins that we may have and God, the way that we act, but also the condition of our hearts. So God, I pray that this morning we would recognize how we have been passive, but God, seek to turn away from it and move into a gospel, a spirit-led gospel proactivity. God, we love you so much and we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen.